Welcome back to The Lead. Five days after the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history, there are still so many unanswered questions. What exactly did the terrorist's wife know before the fact? What were the motivations, perhaps multiple motivations, that led a twisted killer to slaughter 49 people at a gay nightclub? And could police and the FBI have done more to prevent the attack? We're back with my panel of experts, former Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Rogers, also former assistant FBI director, Tom Fuentes. Let's start first on motivations here, because you're getting so much information now. Uh, the fact that he'd visited the gay club before, he had friended people on gay dating apps. There was even talk that there was porn on his computer, including gay porn. Uh, there are these past anger issues our reporters have been learning back, going back to childhood. There is spousal abuse. There is frustration he expressed when he was denied entrance to one of these uh, police academies there. You get a lot of anger on a lot of different levels before he pledges allegiance to ISIS. So in your view, perhaps, Mike, I can start with you because you've seen a lot of cases like this. Uh, was it too early to call this a jihadi attack from, from the moment uh, we heard about it? Uh, I don't think so, mm -hmm. for this reason. So when you look at what uh, motivates a recruit to jihad in the first place, they have an, a, an assorted past normally. Mm -hmm. Everything from criminal behavior yep. to non-criminal behavior. You have people who are doctors and educated physician or uh, uh, you know, uh, college-educated individuals with no criminal past or no behavioral past get recruited. So he sought a permission slip for his behavior, mm -hmm. and he found it right. in Islamic jihadist uh, uh, obviously propaganda that, that, that they found on his website, mm -hmm. that they found on his personal computer. He had talked about it. He had obviously had conversations at the mosque, the same mosque, by the way, where someone went over to Syria from that mosque Suicide bomb. and blew themselves up. Yeah. So there is clearly a pattern here, and he was attracted to that ideology. And a lot of people are attracted to that, that ideology because it's empowerment, makes them stronger than their neighbors, stronger than Gives people them an, around an them. an identity. Absolutely. And so I, I wouldn't say that it was, it was too quick to do it. And I wouldn't let people give a pardon to the fact that this was a jihadi-inspired event. Okay. T Tom, if I can ask you, there's been a lot of questions about the FBI here, warning signs, et cetera. One of the most recent was a gun store owner saying that he had come weeks before, uh, tried to buy a body armor, tried to buy a lot of ammunition. They said they had called the FBI. Now we're right. learning they didn't call, but... But the FBI did go to visit the store. What, right. what do you think is important about that? I talked to senior executives at the Department of Justice earlier today. And what I was told happened in this case is that he didn't call. Right. And that what happened is other gun shop owners in the area called and said there are four men in here, very suspicious, Middle Easterners. They're looking at uh, guns and police equipment. And so the FBI uh, immediately responded, went to numerous gun shops in the area, tracked down those four individuals, and it turned out they were police officers from the Middle East. So that turned out to be false. But in the process of making the rounds to the gun shops, they went to this gun shop. And then they were told, oh, yeah, this guy was in here a couple of weeks ago. He tried to buy body armor. He uh, tried to buy ammunition, and, uh, and he didn't, and he got away. But they didn't have a name. They didn't call. And not only didn't call, they didn't record his license plate number. They didn't record a description of him. And the video surveillance camera that they had in that gun shop, they overrode it. They didn't even save that video. So, so that wasn't exactly one of the most valuable tips you could well, give and, law and on top of that, on top of that, the gun shop owner is on television saying, I didn't sell him the body armor. It turns out he doesn't sell it anyway. Right. doesn't even have it. So. Well, well, let me ask you about this. Of course, we're getting into the gun control debate now. And I want to step away from the politics for a moment. But General Stanley McChrystal, former commander, U.S. and International Forces in Afghanistan, he wrote uh, an op-ed today talking about this issue. And here's what he said in that op-ed. He said, in my life as a soldier and citizen, I have seen time and again that inactions has dire consequences. In this case, one consequence of our leaders Inaction is that felons, domestic abusers, and suspected terrorists have easy access to firearms. Let me just ask you, I don't, you're not, well, you were a politician, but let's step away from the politics for a moment. As to what works, in your view, are there, there incremental legal fixes that, that not, don't, don't keep guns out of the hands of all bad guys, but, but can help keep them out of the hands of some bad guys? Mike, you first. Yeah, I, first of all, I think we're going to have to have a, 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 a national debate from policymakers. What gets you on the list? Mm -hmm. Is it consistent? And then once you're on the list, what things can you not do? Mm -hmm. uh, and then is there a due process for that individual at a certain point on, on, on being on that list? You're talking about like, in addition to a no-fly list, the no-buy list, as people talk about. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, there's the tied list and all of these other lists. 
A, we've got to better integrate them. Now, I know the 2004 Act asked for better integration, but that integration and technology and getting it in the hands of agents in real time is a very different story. We haven't quite perfected that yet. Those are the kinds of things without this big, you're going to have a lot of chest thumping debates on the Senate and the House floor that aren't going to do candidly. They're not going to fix the problem. If we can get a screwdriver and get in there and fix this thing, I think you can make and leverage up law enforcement's ability to be to inter intercede in these events much earlier. Tom, is there a fix? Because General McChrystal's point was he's a soldier. He's, he's, there's no place, for instance, for assault weapons. Well, he's absolutely right. Yeah. You know, if I could if I could go back to a bigger point that's come up many times in the last couple of years, the militarization of the police. We talk about that. I became a sworn officer as a police officer in 1973, then later an FBI agent for 30 years. Every stage of my career, police and the FBI were being outgunned. You go back to the 1920s. John Dillinger and the others had Thompsons. The, police, the FBI had revolvers. Every step, police have been playing catch up to the armament of the public. We talk about the militarization of the police. We don't want to talk about the militarization of our public. And that's what they're up against. You saw the police officer in Orlando with the bullet he was wearing an army helmet that saved his life, the Kevlar helmet that we issue our troops. Mm -hmm. um, you, they used the Bearcat to break through the wall. They used explosives. That all is provided by the, the, military, military, the military to do operation. a breach on that. So that was all military equipment, and their, their full SWAT gear is military equipment. And people argued that the police shouldn't have it. Well, here's a case where would you argue that now in Orlando? Mike, i got to ask you, because you got a special project, which, which is particularly timely now in light of this attack, declassified, uh, coming up starting this Sunday. Tell us about it. Well, it's, uh, I think it's exciting. If you like spy versus spy, if you want to know the personal side of espionage uh, and covert action and operations around the world, including the hunt for Saddam, the hunt for Zarqawi, the, the first woman who goes to Moscow to be a spy and, and uh, has the KGB chasing her, trying to uh, solicit information from Russian nationals, all of that intrigue is in uh, these eight episodes. And what we'll do is give you that personal side of espionage, the toll, individual toll on the lives of people who through duty, honor, and their service to their country are living the intrigue you get to see uh, in the James Bond movies, only they're not driving Ast Aston Martins and Martinis, maybe Volgas and Carlsberg beer. And, and, it, and it's real life, right? It is this, absolutely this is not real Hollywood. Life. Thanks very much, Mike, Tom Fuentes. A breakthrough in the investigation into the mysterious crash of Egypt Air Flight 804. After experts on board this French vessel located and retrieved the plane's black boxes, investigators may soon be able to determine whether mechanical failure doomed the flight or something more sinister. They'll also be able to hear the final conversation between the pilots as well as any other sounds in the cockpit. The voice recorder is important because it will confirm what the pilots were thinking, what they saw, what they were doing. The data recorder will tell us precisely, second by second, how the plane was performing. Both recorders were damaged, but searchers were able to retrieve the memory units, considered the most important part. The data recorder can help investigators determine how the plane's mechanics were performing, the engines, the speed of the plane, altitude, and thousands of other parameters. The voice recorder can reveal who was in the cockpit, what the pilots were saying and doing, were any of the plane's warning alarms going off. It could also capture other sounds like an explosion. This is a very important step in the investigating process as it marks uh, the beginning of a, of a long process that's going to go on from there. Both recorders are built to withstand extreme conditions. They can survive temperatures up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour, and they're waterproof. I think the chances that they're not going to get anything off it is, is probably pretty low. Uh, advances in technology and solid state uh, technology and in the, in the forensics of getting the uh, material off it have advanced greatly over the years. The flight from Paris to Cairo vanished from radar and crashed into the Mediterranean Sea, killing all 66 people on board nearly one month ago. Until now, the investigation has been stalled, with no evidence explaining what brought down the plane. The airline maintains there were no issues with the aircraft. We have no indications of anything uh, or any malfunctions with the engines as of now. The aircraft was a healthy aircraft. The, uh, 25 days prior to the flight, there was no uh, snags in the, in the technical logbook. With the plane's black boxes now in hand, investigators may be able to unravel the mystery 
of what caused Flight 804 to plunge into the Mediterranean Sea.